Uh, so today, we'll be talking about, I'm not good at doing short names for talks. I do a lot of conference speaking, but yeah. Anyway, from zero to hero, how to embrace machine learning in the cloud, even if you've been putting it off. The most important part of this is that there's so many developers who feel like they missed the boat, maybe. Um, and maybe they feel like it's too late to start, but everyone is messaging them about ChatGPT. So I really wanted to give everyone a way to move forward if you have been putting off learning machine learning or if you're leading a team of people who are asking you how to get started in machine learning. Hopefully by the end of today, you'll have more of an idea of how you can do this on the cloud. Um, I work at a small grassroots company called AWS, so <laughs> it will be AWS themed, but very vaguely. Um, I moved to New York City from Brisbane last year for my job with AWS, and I always put this slide at the start of my talks there to explain to them uh, that Australia is not upside down, and this is where I grew up. Uh, but I wanted to leave it in here for this, and then so excited I got to come back to Perth for this talk, I included now a slide of things that make me feel patriotic about being Australian. Um, <laughs> we start with fairy bread, obviously, quokkas. I'm going to see them tomorrow, very exciting. Uh, we have a day format, which is day, month, year. I have lived in New York City. I don't have slides, that's fine. I have lived in New York City since July last year, and I still do not know the other format. I have no, I, I give up. Um, aluminium, turns out the Americans straight up spell this wrong. They say aluminum, because that's how they spell it. I, I have won so many bets with this as well, because everyone thought I was wrong. Medicare card, self-explanatory. Maxi bonds, I, does anyone know what Trader Joe's is? It's a very fancy, they have these bootleg maxi bonds, they're not good. They are, a, just, I will have like a formal, I'm gonna do like a formal LinkedIn post renouncing them, but they're not good and I'm very excited to eat them while I'm here. Specifically as well, double coat Tim Tams. If you imagine the amount that regular Tim Tams are inflated in the US to sell them to the sad Australians living there, the double coat Tim Tams, they know. They know exactly who their target market is and they charge a lot for them. Um, also, data, I, get, I have a TikTok where I make cloud videos, and I get comments all the time telling me I'm pronouncing data wrong. I will die on this hill. Um, we, uh, at AWS, if I was gonna put a photo in a slide, I'd have to have like the corporate rights to it. So pretend that's bluey at the top. Just pretend, let's just go with it. And then obviously the Wit Sundays. Um, this is how I try to explain to everyone what Mackay looks like, even though anyone that's been to Mackay knows that it does not look like that, but like, <laughs> I've got to rebrand it, I think, for the US so they understand. Anyway, so all that to say, this is where we're getting started with. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and then this why AI and ML matter, this is one of the official slides on it, uh, but none of you care. You care enough to come to this so you know why it matters. I don't need to tell you how synergistic and business critical it is. Obviously, the more people who message you, like your cousin's aunt's uncle messaging you about something means you probably should care about it now if you don't. Additionally, there's still so much good opportunity to get really involved in this. Um, actually, hands up who's in the first five years of their tech career. So say you graduated maybe 2018, 2019-ish. For everyone else, imagine how much these people have done in the start of their career and how much you would tell them there's still so much more to learn, you've done so much in this time. When you feel like it's too late for machine learning, these people already have done that with regular development, big air quotes. But there's so much time and space to be moving through and creating a new future for yourself or working out a different way how you can extend what you are doing. Uh, so we're gonna go through some building blocks so that you know what to Google. Being good at machine learning is being good at Googling. So understanding what you're actually trying to look for because there are some vague words that you need to know which will give you the vocabulary to be able to look through docs, which in itself is an art but being able to understand what you're actually trying to do, this will help you so much more. Honestly, the first <laughs> year or so of learning machine learning is just gonna be figuring out the word that you need because you'll spend two weeks not knowing how to do something, searching for it forever, and then just, uh, we're gonna try and replug this in. Searching for it forever, and then it won't happen. Oh, we almost lost the whole computer. Good afternoon, everyone. So what is AI? This is how I think of it as little subsets. Um, anyone who's been next door will know about reinforcement learning. Uh, so we can see how that all nests in. So AI is any technique that enables computers to mimic human intelligence using logic or if-then statements and machine learning. So machine learning is a little subset inside that. Deep learning, another subset inside of that, as well as things like reinforcement learning, which who's currently winning Deep Racer at the moment? We don't know. All right, Nadia's coming second, but we don't know. <laughs> 
Well, I'm getting heckled already. I was told I would be heckled during the panel, but I'm being heckled already. We're off to a good start. Um, so this is, I wanted to put this in. So this is the SageMaker docs for uh, different types of problems, but in a way that makes sense for my brain. This is being good at machine learning, is being able to make the docs into something that works for you. Um, if your slides don't work, that's also fine. I'm gonna click to the next one now and it works. Yes, all right. So the problem types. This information was in a big table and I just broke it up into something that made sense. So the different problem types, we've got supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. If you still have to Google the difference between supervised and unsupervised every time you need to know the answer, that's fine. We all start somewhere. Um, and you'll get that. It's just honestly, the more times you Google these words, it will help. I also really recommend making flashcards. So supervised learning is learning from labeled data. So you've already told it what the answer is for the stuff going in, where the model predicts a target value uh, based on input features. Input features are the variables that go in. Target value is the thing that's coming out. So if you're trying to predict the price of a house based on the number of bedrooms, the square footage, whatever, uh, the target value will be the price of the house. Those input features are the things you're telling it about the houses in that labeled data set. On the other hand, unsupervised learning, plot twist, uh, it's unlabeled data. So the model is discovering patterns and relationships in the input data. So these work differently as well, and it's, these are two of the main types that come off, but then reinforcement learning, which you would have seen next door at DeepRacer, is learning through trial and error interactions with a dynamic environment, uh, very synergistic sounding, to maximize long-term rewards. So in reinforcement learning, you're usually giving it a reward function, which is saying you're a little dog, you do a good job, you get a treat, um, and explaining what specifically you get a treat for and what that treat is uh, will tell you a lot about what you're trying to do with that reinforcement model. So once again, this was a big table and I just made it into a flowchart because I still do not think in tables. But the types of supervised learning, these are the big building blocks. So we've got classification models and regression. So classification is we're gonna predict a categorical target value. So of those target values, sometimes they can be numbers that are continuous or they can be a classifier. So We'll go into it, but it could be you want to say if something's a cat or a dog, all of my examples are pet themed, obviously, um, or it could be a cat, dog, or a bird if you're looking at like an adoption data set or something else. Regression, I'm just going to straight up. Should I just unplug and replug in the whole cable and hope for the best? I'm just going to go for it. Just... <laughs> Did that work? Now we've got nothing. A small interlude. Anyway, things that you can ask me about at beers later. Um, number one, things that Americans do that make me mad, but also more importantly, <laughs> different types of courses that you can be doing. Because the thing with machine learning is there's so many ways to learn machine learning, uh, which is the best and the worst thing about learning machine learning in 2023. It's horrifying. You will spend the first two months trying to find a course to do, and you'll end up with this big Excel spreadsheet of like how much it costs, how long it will take you, who told you it was a good thing. It's absurd. Just start literally anything, have a go, that will get you some sort of do any 101 course. From there, start building something. If you take anything away from what we're gonna be covering today is just work out how you can then, oh. Did it get lost? Go into like presenter view, and then it should start again. All right, are we back? Yeah, we're totally fine. Yeah, we'll be fine. No? All right, anyway. Yeah, so you're gonna find courses that you need to do. Um, I'll have a link at the end later. I just finished doing a six-week uh, Twitch course on introduction to machine learning with two expert co-hosts from AWS. They are the expert co-hosts. I was the personality hire on that one, but it was really good to get involved. Uh, with that, and we got lots of really good questions from that course that I'm still adding into more content coming up. So that is a very good place to start. Additionally, within AWS, there's something called Skill Builder, which is a platform with lots of learning. I will be linking to other courses in there as well. Oh, yes, yes, something happened. All right. Clap for AV, yes. We're back. Uh, so the classification splits up into two things. So the binary is cat or dog. Multi-class is what it sounds like, so multiple classes of that. So binary, assigning an input to one of two. This is how you can tell this is what the docs say, and then my assumption of this is dog and cat. When you're learning machine learning or anything like this, there are so many new words that you're coming to. Just find literally any way to make it interesting to you when it starts so you can make sense of what's happening. Ooh. And then we're gonna go through a multi-class classification is what it sounds like. So an input to one of several classes based on its attributes. Now, unsupervised learning when we dig into this. 
Once again, remember this is the unlabeled data, so we haven't given it the answers yet. First from here is dimension reduction. Some of these will sound familiar, some won't. Um, dimension reduction is transforming high dimensional data into a lower dimensional space while keeping significant properties. You might think that sounds boring, I'll never use it. This is really important when you're working on enormous models because the amount of data you need to get through to get to those high impact answers is enormous. So things like this, even though it does sound boring, will help you so much along the way. Um, underneath this, we've got cluster analysis. Pretend that's on the screen. So this is when you're classifying objects into group based on their similarities. So if you are an e-commerce company, maybe you want to classify your customers based on how much they buy. So you've got personas. You know how in marketing people make personas and they just like make them up? Um, you can help them to, I worked in marketing, I'm allowed to say this. Uh, you can um, say that you're going to classify your customers based on something else, and because it's unlabeled data, you can see what those groups turn out like, and maybe there's a big discrepancy with what you're actually doing for your personas, or maybe they line up, but if you have a look, you'll actually find out, which once again is a moral of the story with machine learning. Um, underneath here, oh yes, it worked. Anomaly detection, oh, I jinxed it then. Identifying rare items. So you're trying to detect those anomalies. There's actually lots of different ways to do this, um, and depending on the type of data you're working with, it does change. Um, it depends is a common theme in machine learning, which we will touch on more and more. And de density estimation is what it sounds like. You're trying to un make estimates of the underlying probability density functions observed on observed data. If you don't know what that means, that's fine. You probably will not have to do this. We've got music, perfect. <laughs> Common misconceptions is that machine learning is not about music, it definitely is. Um, so what we've been talking about a lot of today is that it's too late to learn AI and machine learning. Um, this is a Hacker News post. I'm 28, is it too late to get started with AI and machine learning? Everyone in the comments is so wholesome and nice saying it's never too late. Here's 20 courses that I would like to recommend, they're up there. Um, and then here's what you should be doing, here's everything that's happening. But look at the date on this. This is from 2017. Imagine how good this person is at machine learning now. So everyone that we were saying earlier, if you're in the first five years, this, is, this person will be so good now because they just started. You're still, I know it feels like everyone is doing machine learning now, but really they're just the loudest people that are. There's a lot of space left to do innovation and to track this in with whatever else you're doing. Um, and it's just about finding how that's going to work for you. Another misconception is that there's a single correct way to do machine learning. Uh, it depends. Is it going to work? Yes? Yes. Uh, this is not just a consulting meme. It does really depend on so many things. So it can depend on maybe is there a perfect model, but for the data that we have? Or even if there is a perfect model, can we use that in what we need to be using? If you need to have something serving edge uh, inference, can you actually get the model in a small enough size so you can be doing that? It really does depend, and even the amount of accuracy and precision that you need in a model changes depending on your business and so many different things. It will be annoying because you think everyone's doing consulting speak to you, but it genuinely does depend. And this is the difference between doing two years and five years of machine learning, is knowing what it depends on and how you can figure your way out through that. Slide work. On this slide, it's unfortunate this isn't showing up because the slide says, is, is this milk okay to drink? This is disgusting, but this will help you remember. So the thing is, is like, if the milk is getting close to its use-by date at home, that's one thing, but if you're going to put it in your work fridge, probably a different thing. Oh, ooh, this is fine. It's Amazon's computer. Um, if we're... <laughs> oi, oi. We're gonna cross our fingers. I'll just go okay on that. Yeah, it's totally fine, you can have my data. Yes, all right. Is the milk okay to drink? One thing I found when moving to the US is that they have state-by-state -state labels for this. They can't even unite under like land of the free, home of the brave on what type of milk you're allowed to drink and when. Uh, so in Michigan, it might be on prepackaged perishable products and dairy things. Montana requires that milk be labeled with a sell-by date of 12 days from the pasturation. They, that is not the same in all of America. They will sell you milk much more than 12 days. So it's just state by state. So the idea of like, if the milk is okay to drink, what is that for your company with the model that you're using? What is, when is good enough? When is that? When is the data good enough to come in? What sort of tests do you even need with monitoring? So you need to understand like, what this means for you. And if you can't have this discussion with your leaders, they're not gonna have the information to make that call either. So help them see on what it depends on and then help them to get to the bottom of the problem so that they can get a really rounded understanding. A misconception, you need to be a mathematician to do machine learning. Uh, I, a, a fun fact about me is uh, I did a pure mathematics degree, don't recommend it, 
but you end up with a very specific type of problem-solving brain, which does help, but you do not need that for lots of machine learning. I, uh, Derek, close your ears. I call this the cake diagram because there's three layers and that's why it's cake. But really, this is how machine learning works on AWS. I did not understand this for the longest time when I was learning machine learning before I worked at AWS, and it made no sense to me. But this is how it all fits in. So at the bottom, you've got your bare bones, things like EC2, the custom chips like Trainium and Inferentia. Uh, Trainium is custom for Trainium. Inferentia is custom for inference, shocking. And then you've got SageMaker in the middle, which is Amazon's uh, managed machine learning service. So you would have heard Nadia talking about this for things like feature engineering, feature store. You can even do SageMaker Clarify, which will do so much for your uh, fairness and bias avoidance, even monitoring all things like that. It's got a lot of pieces of that puzzle. And at the top, you've got AI services, including my second favorite AWS service, um, which is Amazon Celebrity Recognition API, which tells you which celebrity you look like the most if you turn the confidence level down as low as it goes. Um, but all sorts of things that are pre-trained to do a specific thing. So anything on the bottom, you have to do a lot of thinking. The middle, you have to do a middle amount of thinking. And the top is like, how can I hit an API endpoint and get an answer? There's even a recognition model that does image detection or if you're wearing correct PPE. And you can have out of the box, it's got like a helmet and gloves and a mask and things like that, but you can train it to do other specific PPE if there's something like that. Um, all of these things are out of the box on that top level. So the icing on the cake, it is the easiest one to deal with. So we're gonna have a whole session about mathematics, but for now, this is that. And another misconception is that once you've made a model, uh, you're just ready to roll, and it's easy to just pop into production, which someone told me once and I will never forget. As you heard in the machine learning operations talk by Nadia and Derek, uh, that's not real. So the reach of machine learning is growing. This is one of the corporate slides that I have and in the middle, the middle card. So it says, by the end of 2024, 75% of enterprises will shift from piloting to operationalizing AI. But that's a bit weird, because when you look at other data that's out there, only 53% of projects at the time I took this, which I think was 2021 data, um, from AI make it through to production. So half are just getting stuck in proof of concept phase. If stuff's in proof of concept, it's not in your product. So if you haven't operationalized anything, it's just not working out. My biggest thing for this is like, as a senior leader, I want to have an if-then statement in my company so that I can say I'm Elon Musk at the golf course. Like being able to have something, when people say, oh, it's learning with you, or it's learning over time and getting smarter over time. If there's no retraining pipelines in there, if there's no monitoring of what's actually going on, it's not. You've just started with a single model and you're letting it rip and just not doing any due diligence over time. So making sure something is actually getting through to production is really, really hard. That's why there's an entire conference talk about that today. And that's why there's an entire specialization now of MLOps engineers, the people that just do this. It's fine if you don't know how to do that, but you just need to know that this is an issue so you can have those conversations later on. Um, on the same note, AIML models are set and forget. Data is like rotting fruit. Like the moment you have the data, great but it's just gonna deteriorate immediately. If you put code, like regular code on a shelf and come back to it, it will be the same. Uh, there's a thing called like model drift in machine learning. So the closest it is is when you immediately launch it and then it's gonna split off. So if you're, detect if you're predicting whether or not someone should get a loan uh, based on their salary, imagine how much that salary data changes year to year. So every year you leave that go, it's just gonna split off more and more for reality. So it's just not going to stay truthful, which if you're going to make a data-driven decision, the data you're making that decision with needs to be correct, and you need to have all of the information you need from that. So it really is not set and forget. I explain this with a children's toy in a video that you can look here on the Build on AWS YouTube channel. I think there's also videos of Derek on the channel if you can look. I don't know how incriminating they are. But this is how I explain it with a marble run. I got the idea from a survivor challenge. There's one and they have like one arm tied behind their back and they have to keep adding balls to this marble machine until they uh, have some sort of a mental breakdown. And that's how MLOps is for a lot of people. And the problem with MLOps is you can't fully explain the terror of someone of terror of the process to someone that's non-technical because they do not understand how many things you have to juggle at the same time. So I literally will set this up for them and try to get them to do the survivor challenge. And then plot twist, they understand the value of MLOps after that. So it's just about finding out how you can explain this to different leaders, how you can get non-technical people along the ride with you. Um, and then from that other side, if you're a non-technical person, how you can then get in the more technical side and weasel your way in. Now we're gonna talk about the G word which is generative AI. 
Um, so this is a professor of computer and information science in the University of Pennsylvania and an Amazon scholar. So generative models are trained on inconceivably massive collections of text code images and other rich data, yes. So the producing co coherent and compelling stories, new summaries, poems, we all know this. But the other side of this, so the generative and generative AI refers to the fact that the technology can produce open-ended content that varies with repeated tries. So this is different to normal machine learning, which is solve very focused and narrow prediction problems. So you can really branch things out in a way you couldn't before. Um, I have a whole section at the end of this talk called Amazon Secret Menu Items, and the Amazon Science blog is one of the best secret menu items. No one knows about it. No one ever sees any of the content, but it is fantastic. This article is great. I'm using lots of the graphics from this later on. But there's also there's an entire article with the data scientists who made Code Whisperer, which is Amazon's generative AI coding companion. Um, and they're talking how they made this. They even have a preprint paper that they've been getting published alongside making the product in all of their free time. And it's incredible. The most underused resource uh, at AWS. Does this just work? Aha. So when I said I had really good graphics, this is how it's explaining um, how to use context to predict the next word. So if it's just you're looking at when they're, what they're opening, it could be anything, but because it's students, it then changes the idea. So this is how, this is not all of how LLMs work, but this is uh, an idea you can get. Um, if you would like to know more, if you would like to have a good comeback for people that ask you about ChatGPT and how it works, there's a game called Symantle, which is like Wordle, but it matches the words based on how semantically similar they are. So it uses word to vec which is an NLP sort of library that helps you to do NLP and judge the similarity of words. Is it how JGPT works? No, but you get to try it. I do the junior ones as well, I really recommend. So you start, it's like Wordle, but you start with a guess. So say like beach or sunset or something, and then it will tell you if you're, how close you are to the word. And it is so strange how this actually works in practice. So being able to match up what's going on. I am terrible. I have done so many of these. I am so bad. But it really lets you see the scores of how similar words are. And then this notion of how it's getting the numbers there for how likely it is to go will make so much more sense to you. And then your family and friends will get off your back asking you how ChatGPT works and if they can get the app yet. Um, this is the official slide of generative AI services and infrastructure. So we touched on Code Whisperer. Um, Bedrock, I'm sorry, Peter, I cannot get you access yet. I also didn't have access. Uh, SageMaker is the middle piece of the cake diagram. So obviously for lots of machine learning, that's gonna be really good, but there's also SageMaker Jumpstart, which lets you use models. I did a video last week about how you can use this for domain-specific tasks. Um, also Trainium and Inferentia, the custom chips we talked about from the bottom of the cake diagram. So they're custom trained to be performance and compute optimized, also very uh, cost performant as well for that, for doing training and inference. It is what it sounds like. Uh, this is how you can tell they let me make my own content. So when you're using Code Whisperer, your generative AI coding companion, you are in your IDE of choice, and then you can arrow between the little uh, suggestions it's giving you. And to lock that in, you press a tab key. So obviously, I recorded a video with a tabby cat showing you how easy it is to work with machine learning and generative AI. If you would like to get started and see what it's actually like to work with, Code Whisperer is a really good way to start. Um, it works across 15 languages now. There's a video with the same cat telling you which 15 languages it works with now, um, but it's a really good way to get started. If you'd like to just take something back with you that you can get started with, I believe the free tier of this is free. It is what it sounds like. And then you can see what it's like to code alongside this. Uh, the scary bit, it is maths time. So <laughs> one of the big misconceptions is that you need to be a mathematician to do machine learning, um, but really how much maths do you need to know? Uh, it depends. But I, I really think you need enough to be sensible, and what does sensible mean? It depends. So it really depends on what you're doing, but also you should have a look and see what you're actually trying to do and how much you can get away with, but learn maths because it's fun. So when we're going back to the article from the secret menu item of the science blog. So now if we're thinking, has anyone heard of like watermarking and they're trying to see when people are, if they're, allegedly cheating on assignments, how they might check if someone has allegedly cheated on an assignment. 
Um, this is an example of how you can do watermarking, and I wanted to bring this up because it's an example of how you can use a sensible amount of maths to make a good choice and not in a way you would think. So the words are divided into green lists and red lists at each step. Um, but it's secret, so the users don't know which is a green and which is a red word. So the next word is less than sampled if we're looking at only from a green list. So a human generating a sentence is unaware of the division between red and green, right? So if a human's just typing, they'll do a mix of everything else. Um, so on long sentences, it really is unlikely. How unlikely is it? I'm so happy you asked. Um, so the red and the green lists are roughly a 50-50 split of words, um, and so the LLM is only going to choose from the green list, and users don't know which word is which, so the likelihood that a human would get a 10-word green sentence is really small. So then if you see that score being really low, that's why that is. This is not how all watermarking works, but if you did not know about just vague probability, you would not have a really easy, low cost of compute way of watermarking. So the problems that you get into, because it's one thing to say, great, we should do watermarking, great discussion. However, how do you actually do that in a way that's going to work can get really complex. And you don't have the overhead, you don't have the compute time to do that, you don't have the overall resources. This is a smart amount of maths to get you through. Um, you won't always necessarily know what that is, but just getting an idea of how all the systems are working is what really needs to happen. And overall, understanding the maths of machine learning will no help you to understand, if I pull this lever, what is actually happening. You absolutely do not need to learn it, but if you would like to go on a rollicking adventure this long weekend, there is a free skill builder course called Math for Machine Learning. Um, you will go on a rollicking tail through vectors and matrices, linear algebra, probability theorems, univariate calculus, and multivariate calculus, with none of the hex debt that I have for my mathematics degree. So that's great to see, but it will really help you to understand what's going on. If you have a uh, children, family, or friends that are in university, it'll be a great bonding experience. You can complain about doing your maths homework together. It really brings the family together, but also you should learn because it's hard. Um, and if you're working with junior staff and you forget how hard it is to learn something for the first time that you know nothing about, it is an incredibly constructive experience to go through and just see how, you always tell them like, don't give up, keep reading the docs, just Google something else. Do all of those things that you tell the people you manage to do um, this long weekend. And then you'll be able to really put yourself in their shoes more, but also you could learn together with them. It's just, maths is hard, but that's why you should do it is something I say a lot to justify my student debt. But it is really important if you're doing a lot of this to really understand how things are working, especially when you dive deeper into sort of bias and variance measures and things. I will go through a really good resource for that. That's what the music is telling me to do. Uh, now I wanted to go through some next steps and secret menu items. Oh, first of all, this isn't actually, so there's like a very serious list of um, icons that we're allowed to use from AWS. This is a real one. There is like three of dogs, one of machine learning. There's even the Da Vinci Vitruvian Man thing. There's also a ham bone. This is my first secret menu item is that that is an official icon in the set. Um, second of all, so the AWS Developers Podcast is separate to the official AWS podcast because we're allowed to waffle on about technical things a lot more. Uh, so I co-host lots of these episodes. My colleague Linda co-hosts lots of these. Uh, the regular hosts are Dave Izbitsky, who is he's from New Jersey, so he is an honorary Australian. And my manager, Emily Freeman, who wrote DevOps for Dummies, hosts most of the episodes. Um, so if you're interested in any of these services that come out and you want to see what the development teams were thinking, uh, there's a really good, if you're using EventBridge and EventBridge Pipes specifically, there's an incredible episode with Nick Pinsky, and he just goes on an absolute tirade about it. It's incredible. Um, and you get to ask him so many questions that you wouldn't otherwise see. This information is not really written down elsewhere. So I obviously unbiased because I don't listen to the episodes that I'm on, so it doesn't count. But the other episodes of everyone else that I listen to, I really enjoy and I learn a lot about how the services are working, especially if you're studying for a certification. It's one thing to read the certification material, but if you understand the steps that the actual development teams went through making it, you understand so much more about why a service is like it is, if that's something that annoys you sometimes. Now, the AWS Stack Overflow Collective so on normal Stack Overflow, you do not know who's answering the question. Um, the cool thing about the AWS Stack Overflow Collective, number one, my coworker Julie runs this, 
Uh, number two, the questions that are answered by official AWS people, that I'm one of a couple people that can give people badges for that, um, you know that that's correct, right? So you know where the answer is coming from, which in the age of LLMs is increasingly valuable. So you'll be able to see that all of these numbers are wrong, so you can click the QR to see how wrong the numbers are. But there's so many questions that have now official answers and verified answers, because we can verify an answer is correct even if that person is from the community. Um, and they're also correctly tagging the questions now. So if you're really interested in S3, uh, you just love to learn about S3, this is a really good way of going through that. Um, my six part Twitch machine learning show, uh, none of you would have been awake when it was actually on Twitch, but the good news is, is it's all available on demand at this QR code. Um, so me and Ben and Fred went on a six week adventure into teaching absolute beginners machine learning. We also give homework every week and to my absolute horror, people did it, incredible. Uh, there's a hashtag of quick start on AWS machine learning. I can't remember, if you look at my Twitter enough, you will find it. Um, and there were so many people completing the homework along the way. This is a really good example of how you can get started and some little steps you can take. Um, you can still send me your homework. I will still give you a sticker. But um, it's a, I really enjoyed hosting it. I really enjoyed the questions that we got in what we were doing. Let's show me this one. OK, so another secret menu item is the Cloud Computing Concepts Hub. I work at AWS, and I only found this like three weeks ago. There is a page, uh, and they have what is for all of these topics. This is just the filtered down view of machine learning. And then they'll have specific FAQs that are really agnostic, don't relate to services, but like specifically what is data cleansing. Specifically, what is feature engineering? And it will give you why this is like it is, what are the different types. If you're looking for words that you can Google, this is an incredible resource um, that's really plain and writing through. Additionally, it's, these are just the filtered ones for machine learning. There are, there's a whole tab for serverless, a whole tab for a lot of other categories. It's a really good way of getting started and level setting that information if you're trying to then teach someone else. Or if you're working on your own notes and you need to fill in gaps, it's a really good way to start. I talk to a lot of people about why they don't learn machine learning, and lots of them are really scared uh, that they'll run up a bill on SageMaker. I get it. So SageMaker Studio Lab, I have the absolute honor of having the username Brooke on this service because I was one of the first people to sign up. But it's free. So it's separate from your regular AWS account. That's why you need to sign up separately. It doesn't even have a credit card connected to the account. Uh, you have to put in a phone number, I believe, just so you can't have 50 accounts mining Bitcoin, but it does give you free CPU or GPU usage per day, um, so you can get started. If you're someone that's learning machine learning and you just want to start, you don't want to have to spend your long weekend setting up the Jupyter Notebooks, it will just work. You open it and it just works. You also get 15 gig of persistent storage, so you can leave some data sets in there alongside your notebooks and you can have like a nice little air gap section you will not, it won't bill to your account, it does not bill. There is no billing on Studio Lab, different to SageMaker Studio. Studio Lab is completely free and it is separate. And if you're looking for somewhere to get started that you wanna be able to just tear it down and like rage delete constantly, this is a place for you because you also won't delete anything important because it's completely separate. So Jupyter Notebooks, we'll talk about some more, but Jupyter Notebooks are really great because you can have text and code together. So I'll talk about what you should be doing in them later, but when you're writing this, you should be writing your own notes alongside code. It's something that will help you to really synthesize that information. I only did good notes at university when one of my friends was sick and I was writing notes for them. So I really would encourage any time you're doing these notebooks or editing them when you clone a repo, I'll show you which repos to clone. Um, when you're going through and cloning those repos, don't forget that you should add notes for this, and then when someone else at your organization wants to learn, you'll have like an incredible resource that they can then use as well. What repo should you clone? I'm so happy you asked. So Machine Learning University used to be how Amazon trained internal data scientists, um, but they made it public, I think, a year or two ago. This is, without a doubt, the best place to learn machine learning that is technically rigorous and easy to start. So there's videos, there's GitHub repos to clone, um, they also have notes alongside them. Additionally, the data sets are included. If you're trying to find data sets to use, it's really annoying because you're trying to find a data set that like, works for specifically what you want, but you can just like clone the whole repo of a course of your choice, and then you can get started. Because if you're trying to learn machine learning in a way that's going to give you like a portfolio of projects you can talk about, 
that's really hard to do. So if you know you want to get a job with this in two years, you can't just say, I know computer vision, if you've then got nothing to show that you can do this. So if you go into these MLU courses with like, how can I make a portfolio of work that I can then explain how I built it, it's really helpful. Um, I recommend starting with a tabular data one to get started. There's a, there's a dog's themed data set in there, which is why I know about it. You predict um, if the dogs, like how likely a dog or cat is to get adopted based on a number of input features. Um, and it's, they don't die, it's fine, it's a no-kill shelter. But um, it's a really good place to get started and it's very technically rigorous. And that's the most important thing because sometimes uh, it's a bit like if you're trying to learn blockchain in 2018. Lots of the people making courses are just really good at marketing, but this is like this was running internally at Amazon for a really long time, so they're not trying to upsell you on anything because like that was made for employees. So it's very helpful. Um, the videos are really good to follow alongside as well. And like I said, you can just clone the whole repo straight away into Studio Lab. When you go into the GitHub's for these, you don't even have to open. So in, like when you're in Studio Lab, there's like a Git thing so you can do the repo. No, no, there's a button in GitHub that just says open in Studio Lab and it will do everything for you. It is the most easy way to learn. Um, this is actually a secret menu item because no one knows about this. So MLU Explain has its own GitHub website. These are the single best resource for learning, or like understanding machine learning that I've ever seen. There's interactive graphics on all of these pages. So you can see if I move this one data point over here, it will move everything else that's happening. There's a really good um, one for test, train, and validation data splitting, with cats and dogs, obviously. And you can see if I move a data point over, how does this change what we're then working with? If you really want to understand pulling this lever, what happens, this is the single best thing. I used to try and draw notes for this, and it did not make sense. Um, this is incredible, and it's very helpful. If you would like to get started, I recommend on the next slide, there's one for linear regression, um, which the example for linear regression is always a house price, but this is showing you later on, it even shows you, you know the R squared thing that you do in Excel? Um, it shows you specifically what that is. There's a button to shuffle the data points, and it will redraw the line and give you a new coefficient to work out how it's going. Fantastic resource that you can see. I've never seen an interactive resource like this elsewhere. They just added one last week, I believe, about neural networks as well, which is a really good place to start if people keep asking about that. When I was asked saying about what you should be writing in your Jupyter notebooks, does anyone have kids that have to do book reports every time they read a book? Um, this is what you should be doing for every one of your early machine learning projects. Thinking about like who are the characters? So what, what are you actually building? What are you trying to find out? Where's the data coming from? What did you learn? What were some themes? What was the story of the process that you did? When you get into in the weeds of data processing, which you will learn all about in the, uh, specifically the tabula data set, I believe it's day two, part three, um, for the data cleansing, you'll get through. So understand just like, think about the things that you need to look at and then make your own book reports for these. In Hugging Face and a lot of other machine learning libraries, they even have model cards. So model cards are just a really quick way of explaining what's going on in a model. But they're just, they're a book report, right? They tell you like at a glance on a single pane of glass what the model's about, who built it, what's going on, where is it going from? So think about how you can set yourself up for success with this because once you learn machine learning and you do such a good job because you're so technically rigorous at this, everyone that you work with is gonna say, hey, how did you learn that? Or you had that really good example of a computer vision thing that I could do this weekend to make a project with, what can you tell me about it? If you've kept all of your book reports, you'll be able to send that to them and help get them started. Um, in my house in Brisbane, before I moved, I had this big piece of art that was like, be who you needed when you were younger, and I've built a whole career on that. And this is a good way of you can pass on your learning um, without having to sit there the whole time someone's learning with you. So think about how you can write better notes for yourself that you can then have as like a resource in your company, especially if you're working at a big consulting firm, being able to have stuff pass on is really helpful. Um, I, I see the timer says 1.30. Uh, if anyone has a question that they're not brave enough to ask me, that's fine. Uh, you can ask me over some synergistic beverages. But this is my Twitter, where you can find a lot of the content that I would not get away with posting on official company accounts, including the cat videos. Um, and if anyone has any questions, we would maybe not have time. I see some anxiety on his face. Oh, Hamish is pumped. So <laughs> is anyone brave enough to ask a question? Uh, anyone got any questions? You can just tell me about your feelings, or otherwise. Anyone brave enough? 
Zainab, the big Z. Ooh. Here we go. He's doing a jog. Um, you talked about that uh, you can't leave your machine learning and just let it go. You have to monitor it and validate it. Like, mm -hmm. what are the strategies that you can automatically validate it? How does the testing work in machine learning work? You're having the goal to ask me this while you're sitting next to Nadia. <laughs> the absolute, the goal, the audacity. No, so really, it depends. Um, so it depends on how your model is running, uh, where it's structured, where it's saved. It genuinely, like I am not trolling you, I wish that I was, but it genuinely does depend on a lot of services that you're running in the background, or even lots of the things you used to have to do. There wasn't a specific service within SageMaker for lots of this, even 18 months, two years ago. The amount of growth that's happened in that whole function is incredible. So you used to have to do some weird stuff with like step functions before to do MLOps, so monitoring that was totally different, but then if you can use SageMaker model monitor, that will have a lot of the stuff as well as the MLOps stuff within SageMaker. It depends, moral of the story. Everyone take a shot every time I say it depends. A synergistic uh, one more question. Anyone? Someone's feeling brave. Someone far away so Hamish has to run again. Please no. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, we got a jump. Okay. He's on the move. You're in a stadium, you gotta. Yeah, so my question is, um, if you have to maintain your model, uh, you need to feed it new data. How would you automate the data cleansing, right? So if you have outliers or something corrupted, yeah. how would you automate that detection? Well, see, even when you're saying, like, if you have an outlier, the idea of what is an outlier depends. Um, so you need to be able to have, you have to have an understanding of what you're actually looking for, first of all, um, because automating it isn't letting the computer just make all those decisions for you. It's really figuring out what are the levels we're OK with and how do we get around this. So SageMaker Model Monitor, number one, really good. SageMaker Feature Store will do lots of this as well. So if you've already got your feature, your pipelines and everything, features are the input variables. Um, you can have your pipelines already set up so that they're ready to go. And then you can have sort of any, um, they're not called quality gates, but the idea of like these are the standards we've got in. You can have them stored, shockingly, in Feature Store, and then they can come from there. Um, you can also get data wrangler specific pipelines. There's also a library of stuff that works on pandas that's specifically developed in the, it's the AWS SDK for pandas, I think it's called. There's lots of stuff in there. Uh, the answer is it depends, but it's just depending on what you're trying to do, where that data is coming from. We've at least got one person laughing at the it depends stuff. Um, but laughing. yeah, you just have to honestly try a lot of things. Um, and it's why the first time you do this, it will take you four to six times as long as you think it will, but then you'll know what to do next time. And this is why keeping good notes about what you're doing will help you to make those better decisions in future because there's so many ways you can do lots of parts of this. It's just about making like the best decision with the information you have given the infrastructure that you're working on. So I used to work at a consulting firm uh, before I worked at AWS and people would come, I, my whole job was doing sessions for C-suites and company boards and things, explaining machine learning and they would want to do some razzle dazzle machine learning thing, and then I would find out they were running SQL Server 2000 quite literally under a staircase somewhere. So <laughs> it's just depending on where that model, where the data is even coming from, and do you have it in a place that it's actually workable, can change so many things down the line. Okay, I think we're done with questions. Uh, I just want to say a big thanks to Brooke. You handled those issues like an absolute pro. Well done. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming here. <laughs>